Good morning. You're listening to The Morning Show right here on WIFO, 105.5 FM in Jessup, Big Dog Country Radio. It is now time for the world-famous Butch and Bob Show here for the 6th day of April. It's brought to you by O'Quinn & Associates, Murphy Builder Supply, Vans Barbecue, and First Southern Bank. Are you looking for an insurance company that you can call and talk to a live person? Are you looking for an insurance company where you can walk in and talk to an agent? Are you looking for an insurance company that offers multiple companies so they can try and get you the best rate? If you said yes to any of these, then you need to call or come by Oakwin and Associates Insurance Financial Services. We offer multiple companies so we can find the best fit for you. Give us a call at 385-1000 or stop by our office at 212 South Fair Street right here in Jessup. Since 1946, Murphy's Builder Supply has been serving the folks of Jessup, Wayne, and surrounding counties with quality products and knowledgeable service. Matter of fact, they feel they sell service first to make sure you get exactly what you need for your home improvement projects. And with each employee at Murphy's being there for 10 years or more, you know you're talking with someone with the experience to help you with building supplies, tools, paint, and all the things you need from a full-service hardware store. The best choice in home improvement is Murphy's Builder Supply, 156 Northeast Broad Street, Jessup. When it comes to barbecue, Vans Barbecue and Jessup is the place to be. A small family-owned business located at 1876 on the Savannah Highway. Vans Barbecue has lunch and dinner specials. Stop by or call to make an order. The number to call, 427-3358. Vans Barbecue's new manager is Sarah Van. Vans Barbecue offers potato salad, coleslaw, baked beans, and don't forget their delicious mac and cheese. Also, check out their shrimp plates, the best in town. Yes, when it comes to the barbecue, head to Vans Barbecue, locally owned and operated. Stop by and tell them the big dog sent you. Once again, the number to order, 427-3358. Hi, I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Mandy Yeomans. At First Southern Bank, our customers are like family. As a locally owned community bank, we're dedicated to helping our clients succeed. We have loans for every need, whether it's personal or business. We have lines of credit, auto loans, equipment loans, and of course, we offer mortgages. Stop by our bank or call us at 912-588-1010 and see how First Southern Bank can help you. Member FDIC Equal Housing Lender. The following is an exclusive presentation of Jessup Broadcasting, the sports leader in Southeast Georgia. The world famous Butch and Bob Show. World famous Butch and Bob Show right here on WIFO 105.5 FM in Jessup. Big dog country radio. And Bob, how's it going this morning? It's going well. Going well. We got a guest in here this morning. Yeah, Who so, we have very special guests. I'm so excited because you are. Yeah, because he had a tough decision. It was either the world famous Butch and Bob show or to be up there in Dalton, Georgia, with the vice president. And he chose the Butch and Bob show. So I'm just honored. Smart decision, buddy. <laughs> I'm sure. You, I'm sure you want to be up there with her. It was tough. <laughs> I know. It was tough. So what did you flip a coin or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're just honored to have you. Like I said, we've had you on the phone many times. This is good to have you in studio. A lot going on. Where do you want to start? Well, um, you know, I, I kind of want to start with uh, the what I consider to be the, the most important thing right now, and that is last week we passed H.R. 1, and that is the lower energy cost bill. You know, the majority party in the House gets, gets bill numbers 1 through 10, and you prioritize it according to, to what your priorities are. So HR1 for us was our our number one priority and that was the lower energy cost. You know, you can make the argument that what is happening in our economy right now is self-inflicted because day 1 this president this president declared war on fossil fuels on American energy and that led to higher gas prices which led to inflation which led to higher interest rates which led to a lot of what we're experiencing in our economy right now. And it could have been avoided if he had not declared war on fossil fuels and on American energy. And what we want to do is to bring back American energy and to be energy independent again, because energy independence is important not only to our economy, but especially to our national security. And we have to remember that. And H.R. 1 and the lower energy cost bill would do two things. First of all, it will increase production of, of energy and American energy here and also the exportation of American energy, which is extremely important. Secondly, it will do something about the permitting process. And, you know, the permitting process right now in America is just crushing businesses. I always give the example, and I think this is a good example, and, it's, and it is apples to apples. 
the the deepening of the Savannah Harbor project. You know, that project was completed last March of 2022. That project, the permitting pro- process, started in 1996. We're talking about a quarter of a century that it took to complete that project. In that uh-huh. period of time, China has started and completed three ports. We've well, got that's to ports. do something. That's not deepening something. That's ports. Yeah, exactly. From scratch. Mm. And, and, and it's just... You know, that's what's crushing American businesses right now, especially here in our district, because we have a lot of wetlands and we are subject to the interpretation of the guidelines by the Corps of Engineers. And that leads to a lot of problems with with developing areas in the in the first congressional district in the low country. You know, people ask me, I told them you're coming the first thing you want to win. The gas prices all of a sudden starting to spike. <laughs> we made that comment on our way yeah, over here I mean, this morning. We talked about how one hit it went up twenty eight cents. Yeah. Day, I uh, heard on the news on Fox News that we carry that uh, that uh, Saudi Arabia and them are getting together and going to close. You know, sh- kind of shut down production a little bit. So I bought gas that day at three oh one. <laughs> Next day it went to three twenty nine. Exactly, and that's what we're experiencing. Twenty eight right cents now. a gallon. Yeah, and 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 what's so frustrating is we have the ability to pump more gas. And more oil right here in America. You know, here was a president in the State of the Union address, which I was there and I witnessed it. It was just unbelievable. In one breath, he says the reason for high gas prices is because the energy sector is not investing in infrastructure. And in the next breath, he says, and oh, by the way, we're not going to need fossil fuels in the next 10 years. In 10 years, we'll no longer need fossil fuels. (laughs) Well, no wonder they're not investing if you're going to do away with it. Just unbelievable. And you just joining us, Congressman Buddy Carter in the studio is with us. Uh, I haven't, you know, I guess we, we're, we're bored with the war in Ukraine because I haven't seen that in the, the national news the last several weeks. Uh, so what's going on there? Well, uh, again, you know, it's fixing to start back up after the winter and and the the fighting will start back up. And it's, it's certainly important. We've invested a lot of money in Ukraine. There's no question about that. And there's been a lot of criticism, particularly from some people in, in areas of the United States that have suffered, like the train derailment in East Palestine, and, and that, uh, you know, the response there has not been what it should be when we're paying closer attention to what's going on in Ukraine. It is important that we as leaders of democracy in the world, that we defend and, and that we help Ukraine. I've always said I, I, won't, I do not want to see any American blood shed over there. I don't want to see any boots on the ground. I do think that we should help them militarily, but there's got to be a tipping point. I mean, you know, Kevin McCarthy, our Speaker of the House, took a lot of criticism because he said we're just not going to send a blank check. Well, I'm okay with that because I do want to know where that money's going and what it's being used for. I want us to help Ukraine. Uh, it's extremely important that Putin not be successful. It will have ramifications that will be felt for years to come, particularly from China. And I'm concerned right now that China and Russia are, 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 are getting together and piling up, if you will. And that, that could bode for us in the future. Not, not, it could be very, very dangerous. So. You mentioned Kevin McCarthy had a big meeting yesterday. What did you make of that meeting? He did. He had a meeting with Tawan, and um, that that is extremely important because that's what we anticipate happening. Uh, you know, we've identified the three greatest challenges in our country as being China, our debt, and education. And China is, is certainly, they have made no secret about the fact that they want to take Taiwan. They feel like it's uh, part of, of their country. We expect for that to happen, and, you know, we're trying to prepare for it. We want to make sure that uh, Taiwan knows that we're, we're going to help them, we're going to defend them, but now's the time for us to start doing that and not waiting until it happens. We actually had our, our um, conference for the Republican Party down in Orlando um, about three weeks ago, and at that time we, had, uh, we, we discussed a lot about what's going on, and we actually had an exercise, a military exercise, to see what would happen if China were to, to, um, to invade Taiwan and if there was a response by the United States. And that was, that was very, very concerning uh, because it would, it would result in, in, in some, some loss of life that we don't want to see and, and our troops and, 
that's why this meeting with um, Kevin McCarthy as the Speaker of the House and, and with the Taiwanese people and, and their leadership, that's why it's so vitally important. Well, you said months ago on our show that you, you still believe China's going to invade. I do, um, and that's why Ukraine, again, and what happens with, with um, the response that the United States has to, to Putin is so vitally important because China's watching. And, of course, we've seen what happened in the Middle East and China. The influence that China has gotten has, has worldwide is, is concerning in Africa and in Latin America and Central America. Very, very concerning. I had the opportunity to travel over to um, Spain last August, and they were just – I think that was the number one issue they were concerned about. They, of course, have a vested interest in Central America, and they were very concerned about China's influence in Central America. Still a couple of years away from the presidential race, but the Republican people are throwing their hats in, Trump's in. So how do you see this playing out? Does DeSantis have a chance to – get the nomination or anybody besides Trump going to get the nomination? What do you think? Well, I think DeSantis does have a good chance. Um, Obviously, he's done a great job as governor of the state of Florida. I served with Ron for four years in the House of Representatives. He's a very sharp fellow, very smart, and um, obviously talented. Uh, I think he he flourished in the executive branch. He he was... um, he didn't do as, as much in, in the legislative branch, but when he got into the executive branch, man, he's done a great job. But um, nevertheless, it's, uh, you know, he's, he, he's got a, a good shot at it. There's no question about that. But you have to think that President Trump, at this point anyway, unless he is convicted of one of these fraudulent charges, I, I tell you, this guy, Alvin Bragg, is just, I just can't believe they've come up with these charges here. I mean, here is a um, prosecutor who has decreased uh, over 50 percent of the felonies in, in New York to, to misdemeanors, and they've got just a, a horrible crime problem in New York State, yet he's going after a former president like this with, with what I think are just drummed up charges. It, it's really sad, sad for our country, sad for for everyone involved. It's just a, a very sad, sad time. Well, he's made sure he put his name in the history books of America. And, you know, he was the one who, who said during, the, during his campaign that he was going to get Donald Trump, that he was going to prosecute Donald Trump. But I think the most disappointing thing to me, the most appalling thing, I should say, has been the former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, who made the comment, well, Trump's got the opportunity to prove himself innocent. <laughs> what? I thought we lived in America. You were innocent until innocent. you were proven oh, guilty. Well, it can't be fun being indicted, but it definitely has helped his campaign funny. No question about it, that. I mean, I mean he has raised the money a ton rolling. of That's money. The money's just rolling in, so he's got to be happy with that. But uh, what about the charges here in the state of Georgia? They say that is going to be his next big hurdle. It is. He's got some charges here in um, Fulton County, of course. And, um, the, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how all this um, all this plays out. Um, it's almost as if, um, you know, it, it's helping him, and it, at least with, um, with his base. They are even more committed now than they were before. What is the allure of Trump to to his base? I think it's um, and that's a good question. And and I've often wondered about that. Um, look, I I've always said Donald Trump was right on policy, wrong on tone. I mean, his policies I just thought were spot on. We had this economy humming. Uh, this, I mean, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and I don't, you know, goodness gracious, we were doing so well economically, and then this president gets in, and and it seems like his his playbook was whatever Donald Trump did, I'm going to do just the opposite. Uh, you know, if you look at what he's done down at the southwest border, I mean, I'm convinced that he just told his his staff, um, whatever Donald Trump did, we're just going to do the opposite because they have. And it seems to be the same thing with the economy. But, um, you know, the, the allure with Donald Trump is uh, I think that he is right on policy. But one thing I do know, whatever does happen over the next year and a half, we have got to win. <laughs> we have got to take back the White House. We cannot sustain four more years of this administration. They had a biography on the Story Channel uh, over the weekend on Donald Trump. 
from the time that he was a little beep popper all the way up to um, uh, his uh, adult years and, uh, the, you know, his first uh, run for the election. And if you watch that and see the type of kid he was, the type of young business person he was, his father and so forth, that you can understand his personality. And, and you know, some of it has to do with that. Uh, and, and forgive me, I don't mean to. To, to say I'm prejudiced here, but some, you know, that New York mentality, if you will, uh, it's just a little bit different than it is down here. And, and, and we're a lot more laid back in South Georgia than they are up there. But, um, you know, I've talked to some people who are actually in school with Donald Trump and, and they said he was he was sharp. He was smart, a very smart fella. And obviously he's been very successful. And he's, and, and again, I, I think his legacy for his first term in office, if that is his only term in office, and we'll see what happens, and I certainly um, wish him well, but, um, you know, the Supreme Court ad- appointments, I mean, can you imagine if Hillary Clinton had made three Supreme Court nominations? <laughs> I just don't know where we would be as a country. You mentioned the border. That continues to be in the news. Uh, I mean, it's just it's getting worse and not better, that's for sure, but, I mean— where do you see that going? I say the president still has not gone down there to look at it firsthand. I mean, they say they have, but nobody can verify that. I mean, Absolutely. I saw that the other day. Somebody said he, um, I said, well, buddy said he's never been down there. He but, hasn't. You know, I've been there. I've been in Congress for eight years now. I've been there six times, and um, it, it's not getting any better. The last time I was down there it was as, as bad as it's, as it's ever been. You know, two things that we have to do. First of all, we, you know, we got the problem with the illegal immigrants coming into this country. And then at some point, we all know we're going to have to address that. And I, I don't know what that's going to be, whether it's going to, you know, go back from where you came or whether it's going to be, you know, some kind of negotiation and um, between the, the two parties to see how we can help these people stay here. Um, but the second thing and the thing that concerns me the most is the drugs that are coming across that border, the fentanyl in particular. And what's happening, you know, we're losing between 200 and 300 people every day as a result of fentanyl, of, of overdose, much of which is fentanyl poisoning. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I, I had sent a letter back to the FDA uh, about a month or so ago encouraging them to make uh, naloxone which reverses the effect of fentanyl if used quickly enough to make it over the counter. And they did that, and I applaud them for doing that. I'm I'm often critical of the FDA, but in this situation here, I I have to applaud them for what they did. They did make uh, naloxone over the counter, and it comes in a nasal spray that can be administered, and if it's administered um, quickly enough and after someone overdoses, it reversed the effects. Um, I've kept it. I've got it in my backpack. I take it everywhere I go. Um, thank goodness I haven't had to use it. I hope I don't have to, but I've got it with me. It's in the truck right now in my backpack. But he watched that not a national crisis, you know, COVID they, every day and told you how many people died. Well, I mean, they say <laughs> we're losing 200 people a day with this fentanyl drug that's coming across the border. Why isn't that? You know, why aren't they talking about that and talking about that being a national crisis? And that's a great question. That's what people want to know. You know, where's the common sense? If if we had a plane crash and it killed 300 people, they'd stop every plane in this country until they figured out what was happening. They wouldn't have any more flights. Yet we're losing that many people every day as a result of this fentanyl poisoning and a result of, of overdose, much of it fentanyl poisoning. And yet... It's they seem to turn a blind eye to it, and I don't get it. I don't understand it at all. Two things have to happen. One is that we've got to address the situation with how it's getting here. It's getting here over, through the southwest border primarily. Yes, some of it is coming at points of entry, but only a small percentage, only about 10%. Some of it is coming through the mail, but again, only a small percentage. The vast majority of it is coming across that border. In order to stop it, we've got to address that and, and secure the border. The second thing is we've got to address the amount of fentanyl that's already in this country, Another Enough fentanyl to kill every American 13 times over, and the way that we do that is that we do it through uh, through addiction counseling, and we do it through making naloxone available over the counter. I've, and and now that you can get naloxone without any barriers and without having to to any obstacles, 
It ought to be in every emergency box in America. It ought to be in every medicine cabinet in America. And just like when we were growing up, we had Serpivicac, um, you know, in case you had a, a poisoning. And th- that's what naloxone ought to be now in our country. You know, it's not only um, uh, Mexicans coming across the border, but uh, was um, uh, seeing a report on that the other day that it's uh, it's immigrants from all over the place coming through there for various reasons. And one of the things we were talking about China a little while ago, they've got agents coming across the border to infiltrate America, either to use now or five years from now or 10 years from now to get them in places. You know, some of them are technically trained and stuff like that to get jobs in the future and stuff like this. And so it, to me, it is a, and to a lot of folks out there, it is a big national crisis. And you just can't put your head down. This is some people say you can't put your head down on the sand because you think these people are going to vote for you when they become citizens. Okay. And, and it, it is such a major crisis that i know the cartels and other folks got has got to be laughing at our government for making their job so easy to make money and and you know what gets me is that the left wants to essentially turn us into a socialist country well that's what they're trying to escape they're trying to escape just that and yet they think that they want to come over here and and they're going to change this to a socialist country and that they're going to be in favor of that no that's exactly what they're trying to escape. It, and, and you're right. China, when we talk about the fentanyl, the active ingredients for the fentanyl is being made in China, and it's coming from China. Look, we have to understand the Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese people, but the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, they are not our friend. They are not our adversary. They are our enemy. They want to replace us economically and militarily as the leaders in the world. And this is all part of it. I'm sure you heard that we had the the hearing on Capitol Hill uh, on TikTok. TikTok, the popular app that the teenagers use a lot, that is owned by the Chinese Communist Party. (laughs) The parent company owns that. And, you know, people ask me all the time, what's the difference between that app and other apps? Well, that's the difference is that other apps aren't owned by the Chinese Communist Party. That's why I have said, and I I continue to say, that it needs to be banned until the Chinese Communist Party divests itself of any ownership into that app. You can't convince me that they aren't spying on us. They're spying on us. They're using the information. They're influencing people in certain opinions in certain ways. They've got it all down to algorithms that uh, have just, you know, control the folks that are on there in some sort of way. Yeah. I saw Donnie Ray at the county meet EMA director talking to this. You know, there's this push for electric, electric cars. You live in the coastal empire. The question is, say a hurricane comes through, and how do how do those people? Well, their cars not charged up. How how are you gonna get all those people away from the hurricane if you know? And, and God forbid the electricity goes out then they can't charge the car at all. So has that discussion been made at all up there in Washington, D.C.? I, I don't think it's been thought through, and to be quite honest with you. And, and you know, we have um, at least once a year, and we try to do it twice a year, we have all the emergency management personnel come together in the district. And that was one thing that I was uh, a little embarrassed. I didn't, um, I didn't think through it, but they brought to my attention. You know, when they have a hurricane in Florida, they come this, through South Georgia and to, to get away from it. Well, they're coming up here in their electric vehicles. We don't have charging stations. <laughs> and what, are, what are they going to do when they come through here? And they brought it to my attention. I said, you know, that's a good point. And we are trying to, to increase the number of charging stations, but we're nowhere near close to where we're going to have to be at some point. And I don't think, you know, perhaps in the urban areas where they have it more available, yeah, they can accommodate that. But in, in rural areas like South Georgia, we just don't have that ability. Well, we just had those up, uh, new nuclear plant going and, and plant Vogel up, up there near uh, south of Augusta. But that's the first one that's been built in, what, a couple of generations exactly. just about. Exactly. And the thing about it is, and I want to know, is where is all this extra electricity going to come from to charge these batteries? I mean, Texas already has blackouts. California, other states do. Where is this extra electricity going to come from? Well, and, and that's part of the, the problem. Look, we all care about our environment. I care we about it. I mean, sure we do. I mean, I, I get so frustrated when 
And when the left says, oh, Republicans, they don't care anything about our environment, that's, that's nonsense. Of course we do. This is our home. This is where I, I've lived all my life. Some of my fondest memories growing up were going fishing with my dad. I want my children, I want my grandchildren to enjoy that just as much as I did when I was growing up. And, you know, for them to say that we don't care about our environment just really does offend me. Of course we do. The point is, is that we feel like, yes, we need to decrease carbon emissions, but we don't need to decrease choices. We need to have choices. We need to have an all of the above type energy strategy. And they don't think through the whole cycle of it. You know, how are you going to get the, 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 the electricity that you need, the power that you need in order to to build the, the, the electric vehicles. How are you going to, what do you do with the batteries after their life cycle has ended? What do you do with the blades on the windmills after their life cycle has, has ended? All of that you have to think about, and they don't think about it. And these batteries take special minerals, and you got to do a ton of mining to be able to get all those to build these batteries. So no matter what energy you make, there's going to be byproduct from it. And I agree with you. Choices. A person needs to have a choice. Sure. Sure. And and again, um, I don't think the United States of America, and in fact, I, I, I know that we don't get the credit that we deserve here. We have actually decreased our carbon emissions over the last decade more than the next 12 countries combined while still growing our economy. It can be done, but we could go to to zero emissions here in the United States, and unless the world helps us and unless they decrease their carbon emissions it's not going to do any good that's why we need to be exporting american energy american natural gas is some of the cleanest gas in the world 47 percent cleaner than what they have in russia why aren't we using that why aren't we sending that to other countries uh, congressman carter in the um, studio with us this morning and as as a, a person that with the radio station and news and 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 so forth one of the you know the, uh, the things that our founding fathers put in there was free speech because they lived in a society where you didn't have that you had to be worried about every word you said and and it seems like we're getting to that way in our country right now where if you have a particular stand on an issue the opposite side hates you dislikes you don't want you doesn't want you to be able to speak uh, they don't know that person, you know, just like Marjorie up there in New York City. I mean, she was basically run off up there because of speaking. And it's a shame that we're getting to the point right now in our country, both sides, you know, both ways, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter. It's not one way or the other. It's just the fact, oh, you've got that particular uh, opinion on that issue. I don't like you. I hate you. You don't have the right to speak that. You know, as, as a, a person that, you know, is a baby boomer and, and so forth, you know, we've seen different things, you know, from the 50s and 60s and things that has happened. You know, it's a shame that we're getting our country right now where we dislike people to the point that we will do violence against them because we don't share their opinion, don't like their opinion. It worries me. It does. It worries me. I, I see it a lot. Um, with all due respect, I think the media has a lot to do with that, too. Um, social media social media especially <laughs> social media you're exactly right and and that is of concern uh, it, look you know i serve in in washington and we do a lot of things together and we do pass legislation in a bipartisan fashion and there right now of course as as you know being a pharmacist drug pricing is one of my biggest focuses and and has been and continues to be and we're working in a bipartisan fashion right now on the energy and commerce committee that i serve on the help subcommittee to address prescription drug pricing i practiced pharmacy for many years i never went to the counter and said are you a republican or a democrat i mean the price was the price it's expensive for everyone that's why we have to address these issues from that perspective but you know, it, it just seems like the the main focus and and the news is is on those divisive issues and not on because what we it do gets together. ratings, it gets eyeballs on articles, it gets ratings, it gets you know, ears on radio, eyes on television, uh, on internet, and stuff like that, and it draws people to that, and that's how they get ratings, which means more money you can charge for your advertising. It comes down to capitalism, is what it comes down to. <laughs> it does, and but we lead to be in our country where we say. I don't agree with you, but you have the full right to have your opinion. But sure. it seems like we're getting away from that in this country. It does. It does. And, and it's, it's really sad. But um, listen, 
it's going to be okay. We're going to survive, I can assure you, especially, and I I think that's a a message that we really need to take heart this week, Um, you know, being the Holy Week and and with Easter coming up this this Sunday. And we're still a nation that I I think is blessed by God. And and as long as we keep that focus, we're going to be fine. Okay. What is the uh, the next uh, uh, steps for uh, uh, President Trump at this time? Do you know? Well, obviously, he's got his hands full with this, um, with these indictments, um, 34 charges against him. And then, as you mentioned earlier, he's, he's got some other issues in other states that he's got to deal with. So he's got a lot going on right now. I think that, um, you know, it would be interesting to see what the other candidates do and how many other people come out. Nikki Haley, of course. Everybody's expecting Ron DeSantis to run. I know that Tim Scott's looking at it. Um, uh, Mike Pence Pompeo. Pence is looking at it, and, um, you know, wouldn't surprise me one bit if he doesn't get in as well. Okay. And we talked a lot of things that are, are there kind of, kind of um, you know, dividing us in this country. What is the positive things? Well, I think there are a lot of positive things that are, you know, I mentioned drug pricing. I mentioned, yeah. um, you know, in, in the H.R. 1, the lowering energy cost was a bipartisan bill. We had some Democrats who voted in favor of that who understand it, particularly those from – um, oil producing um, states and in, in Texas and um, throughout the Midwest, um, they are they're helping us as well. So, you know, we work on a number of things. China is, it should be a unifying issue as well. Um, you know, that's that's as much concern to Democrats as is Republicans. Uh, we, we have to be concerned about China, and I would hope that education would be one as well. Okay. And I would hope that our debt would. You know, we haven't mentioned the debt ceiling, which is probably going to take a lot of our focus here in the very near future and how we negotiate that and how we get past that. We will we will pay our bills. Uh, I, I hope everybody understands we're not going to default. Okay, Bob, you want to wrap it up? Oh, just good to see you. Again, it's been nice having you on the phone uh, the last several months, but it's always good to see you in person. Appreciate you coming in. Always informative. Always fun to talk to you. So. Wish you well. I know you had a good time with St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It always is in Savannah. And then we had... Uh, the Mayor of Scrivens kind of did you with his... Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> I finished the parade and he came up. I said, what in the world? That's what I said. I said, where did you get that? That's what I asked him. I said, where in the world did you... Uh, but it looks like it was a good time. And the good thing is they didn't have a lot of rest down there. It looked like everybody yeah, kind of... Yeah, I was, I was I kind of shocked everybody was it. glad to be out you know, yeah, after right. the last couple of years. And... And I might mention also that the, the week after we had a um, St. Patrick's Day parade at Shellman's Bluff in right, McIntosh yeah. County. That was a lot of fun, too. Yeah, that uh, was a little more laid back there. Yeah, <laughs> a lot more laid back. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Betty Carter, our special guest this morning, the world-famous Butch and Bob Show. We wish you a great day, and and um, and just uh, you know, feel free to call in or come by any time, buddy. It's good talking to you. Good to talk to you all. Always good to see you. All right. Take care. All right, Congressman Buddy Carter, a special guest here on the world-famous Butch and Bob Show right here on WIFO 105.5 FM and Jessup Big Dog Country Radio. And the show brought to you by O'Quinnon Associates, Murphy Builder Supply, Vans Barbecue, and by First Southern Bank.